but um, I'm Chala Rakchai. Um, I'm a faculty member at Coach University, like Ismail, and um, and as, you know, as I was saying, actually, we live in the same kind of campus faculty housing, uh, even though we don't really see each other <laughs> too much because um, we're on different schedules. I'm on, I'm on a five-year-old schedule, and he's on an adult schedule, I think. And so, uh, what I'm gonna uh, uh, so I, I'm in the psychology department uh, actually, but um, I'm uh, sort of like a biologist. I'm I'm like actually I'm a you know I consider myself an evolution biologist, uh, but I'm in the psychology department, so I I, I have to say I'm a psychologist as well. And um, uh, if I was telling us that we should start with a little bit of a kind of career path, uh, you know, information about you know just to give you a sense of where these how these careers kind of end up shaping. Um, so I did my bachelor's in psychology and biology um, in Middle East Technical University, um, along with this other guy that looks like me, who also you know did his you know bachelor's in Middle East Technical University. Uh, and then I I decided at the end of this uh, at the end of undergrad I that I was going to be uh, initially the reason to study uh, psychology and biology was that I was going to be a neuroscientist and. I was really impressed by uh, this book called uh, The Astonishing Hypothesis by Francis Crick. And uh, I wanted to become a neuroscientist and I decided to study psychology and biology as a result. And uh, in the process, however, I decided that uh, neuroscience isn't that much fun because it involves, you know, cutting things and, you know, uh, a lot of wet lab and, um, and being stuck in the lab, really not getting outside. And, um, and and it also there's actually a lot of you know psychology the psychology itself was actually very very interesting as well so you could do a lot of interesting experiments with psychology so I decided to go on uh, to study cognitive psychology um, uh, in in the United States uh, in the Department of Psychology at the University of Iowa but then after a year that didn't really suit me as well because um, uh, you know that also involved getting stuck in the lab all the time right so. You know, I didn't really like that, so I re reapplied for PhD uh, programs, etc. And then I got into PhD program in animal behavior, again in the Department of Psychology. But it was a PhD program that was mostly, uh, you know, the the faculty and most of the students had a biology background, so it, it, it was effectively an organizational biology uh, PhD program um, that was housed in the Department of Psychology. And in fact, when I was at the University of Washington, at that point, um, the biology department there was actually very quite molecular. So we actually had a higher concentration of organisms and biologists uh, back then in the Department of Psychology than in biology. So anyway, so I, I did my PhD in uh, um, animal behavior, and you know I'm going to talk about a little bit, you know, what I do next. But um, and then I went on to a postdoc, uh, a couple of postdocs at Cornell University and Virginia Tech, uh, working primarily with birds. Um, uh, so I, at Cornell, we, I was uh, part of the Cornell Level Four Ornithology. At Virginia Tech, I was uh, part of the biological sciences there, um, working on you know behavioral and endocrinology. And then since 2017, I uh, I came back to Turkey and have been uh, at the Department of Psychology at Koç University. And this is the campus of the Koç University. Sadly, this is not the Aegean. Uh, uh, it, is, it is the Black Sea. Uh, I wish it was the Aegean, so I, I actually have serious envy uh, with FS uh, workplace. Uh, but yeah, um, anyway, so uh, thanks still for including me, even though we're not technically on the AG. <clears throat> and yeah, you can kind of see that the, the campus is actually in the middle of a kind of what was pristine for, for the most part, a pristine forest, or as pristine as it gets, you know, you know that close to a city of, you know, 15 million people. Um, it's, that's not uh, the case anymore, unfortunately. Uh, there's, you can't see that, but there's a huge, um, um, motorway now uh, passing through this forest and uh, cutting cutting into grass too. All right, so uh, and what I study is uh, primarily animal communication, and I primarily use uh, birds uh, as a model system. Um, and the reason I study animal communication is because um, you know it actually involved, communication is uh, involved in all of this uh, social interaction. So the the larger Kind of goal of my uh, research program is to understand social cognition and uh, social cognition you can define as you know these all, all taking all this information out there uh, in the in the natural habitat of the of the animals uh, about food about predators 
about potential mates um, or actual mates, uh, where, where your actual mate is or where, where you can find potential mates, uh, whether you can cooperate or uh, you know, compete with uh, your conspecifics or heterospecifics, so uh, whether you have related individuals, etc. cetera. And uh, you, you, there's all, all this information out there and uh, social cognition or social cognitive processes take all this information and um, process that and use it in a kind of adaptive manner, okay? And this de depends on your past social experience uh, and your developmental history. And it also depends, of course, on your physiological state and on your genetic background, right? And, you know, the talks that, you know, you've already seen uh, talks about the, you know, these processes, the evolution processes, uh, both, you know, at, at, at the level of genes uh, or genomics and at the kind of the more uh, evolutionary levels, ecological levels um, already. And what I do is kind of, look at most of these at the individual level and uh, the social cognitive processes end up having fitness effects and fitness of course is defined how many copies of your genes you pass down onto the next generation uh, that's the kind of basic standard division definition of fitness and by the way I if you guys have any questions uh, you can uh, ask them over chat and um, by, you and or you can interrupt me anytime by the way okay <clears throat> Um, and then you, these, these uh, fitness effects then have uh, uh, in turn uh, shaped the evolution of social cognitive process. Okay. So that's kind of where, uh, how I conceptualize my research here. Okay. And just to give you a sense of what I, what that actually translates into, into actual research, in actual research is uh, a lot of, so a lot of my PhD was actually about uh, the answering the question, how animals uh, recognize neighbors and the, uh, you know, once they recognize their neighbors, how do they classify them according to the threat they pose uh, to paternity or to territorial integrity, et cetera. So how do they actually use social cognition to the, navigate these social interactions? And this is actually, you know, this is actually the closest research question that is to psychology, right? This is actually a so social psychology research question if, if you apply it to humans, right? Uh, but of course, you know, I, I said social psychology of you know, birth, right? And then in my in my postdoc, I was asking, for instance, uh, questions about physiological processes like uh, hormonal or endocrine processes uh, and how they affect social behaviors and how they are affected in turn in the, in, uh, with, with the social conditions like competition and uh, the need for parental care, okay? And uh, well, a lot of my research uh, during my uh, postdoc and PhD was actually focused on uh, the individual variation in, in others communication. So, and we're gonna, the, the first part of the uh, lecture that I'm gonna talk about that, that I'm gonna kind of uh, uh, cover is about honest communication. Uh, so we're, we're gonna get to that in a minute. Uh, but yeah, so a lot of the, um, uh, you know, a lot of my research uh, program has been focused on whether to whether signals are honest in real, you know, in the nature, and um, whether they're reliable, and whether there's actually uh, whether uh, how individual differences actually are related to this variability, okay, the, the reliability, okay, and by individual differences I mean uh, so what's termed sometimes the personality differences. Some individuals are more aggressive than others. Some individuals are more signaling than others. And this obviously has some, you know, more talkative than others. And again, you know, there's parallels to humans here. Uh, and th this has kind of uh, evolution implications uh, potentially for th the evolution of reliable signal. Okay. And then more recently, I've been uh, talking about, I've been, I've been uh, thinking about uh, these uh, research, the, 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 the fact that humans are actually changing the environment of these animals uh, in a rapid way. There's no, basically no uh, habitat uh, on Earth that is untouched by human influence. And, um, but, you know, animals still uh, live uh, in these habitats. And uh, so uh, the, this kind of represents an evolutionary experiment, if you will, because we are changing the habitat in a kind of rapid uh, time scale uh, relative to the evolution, uh, evolutionary processes. And uh, this, you can you had the opportunity to ask questions about how uh, and communication systems, for instance, or uh, social behavior actually changes with these human in this human altered landscape. Right. So uh, one particular uh, research question is about the impact of noise, for instance, uh, on animal communication. And then uh, I also you know it, it, this is the general I guess research question is how do signals 
respond to or influence these evolutionary processes um, that is uh, happening. And here we have a Darwin switch, and this is <laughs> pretty much the last time I did any real field work uh, in Galapagos in uh, 2020, um, just before the lockdown, the, the pandemic hit worldwide. Um, and uh, so we're, we were interested in uh, understanding the, animal, the signals of uh, uh, related species of um, Darwin's finches, uh, in particular tree finches, and how they actually, uh, how the, each, how these tree finch uh, species respond to each other as signals. Okay. So just to give you a, a sense of, for instance, the uh, impact of uh, anthropogenic changes in animal communication, this is, uh, or animal social behavior. Uh, this is from a recent paper uh, where we actually quantified aggressive responses uh, in response to simulated intrusions and, uh, the, and, and how they relate to ambient noise uh, in that territory. And we found, a negative, we found a positive correlation between ambient noise and aggressive responses. Um, on the y-axis here is ag aggressive responses and on the x-axis is the ambient noise. And the, the noisier the, noise the territory, the more aggressive, the, you know, uh, in this case, the great tits uh, were. Okay. Um, and I'll talk about these kind of experiments uh, later on in the in the in the lecture. Okay, so that's what I do. Um, and uh, what I'm going to talk about uh, in the first part, as I said, is just animal communication in general. So this is going to be more uh, kind of a conceptual uh, lecture. Um, and um, here we have a you know uh, kind of a great. Uh, instance of animal communication or mis misconstrued animal communication from fiction, where uh, uh, obviously, you know, dolphins have a, you know, complex uh, communication system, and they communicate with each other and they can even communicate, learn to communicate with humans uh, in, you know, and other species uh, in complex way. And of course, if you read the Hitchhiker's Guide to the Galaxy, there's a, at the, at the start of it, it there's a, the kind of, they make the same kind of uh, joke about how they were trying to communicate uh, to humans that their their earth was you know uh, about to be destroyed and you know the humans were just mistaking that right so um, and um, they finally said this you know so long and thanks for all the fish and they just disappear right <clears throat> right to understand them in all communications we should first um, define what communication is and um, communication can be most, you know, uh, animal com communication in the in, in the natural world can be defined as transmission of information via signal benefiting both singular and receiver. Okay, the first two parts are you know, generally communication and in general and in any setting. But as an evolutionary uh, definition uh, or that a definition that applies to humans or yeah, to animals rather, rather um, it, you the signals should be benefiting though, or the, the act of the information transfer through signals should benefit both the singular and receiver. And these benefits are on average, uh, defined on average over evolutionary history. So over a long period of time and in most of the context. So this is an average fitness effect in, in, in other words, okay? So here we have uh, a pic several pictures of uh, the peacock spiders, for instance. Uh, and this is, you know, these are visual signals, of course. And here, are the, the males. Uh, these are different species of peacock spiders. Um, they're you know, very colorful, and you know, you know, they have these specialized visual structures uh, that the males display to the uh, females during their, you know, mating dance. And um, this mating dance should uh, signal to the female uh, something about the male, uh, at least the species, species identity and the willingness to mate, and potentially other things like, for instance, the quality of the male. Um, genetic quality, whatever that means, or you know the uh, fecund or kind of uh, the fertility uh, status, etc., uh, uh, of the male, and uh, or you know the the quality of the sperm, whatever, right? And uh, presumably the female benefits from uh, receiving the signal and acting accordingly, and presumably the male is also uh, benefiting from uh, sending the signal uh, to the to the females. And uh, in the, and hopefully you know they uh, at the end of the interaction both the singular and the receiver will benefit right. And of course these are spiders and what happens is uh, you know if the male actually does dance all you know right and then the female actually okay you know decides to mate with the female uh, then they mate and then the female eats the male right. So that's the end of the male. But of course you know he's happy because or you know he 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 dies happy at least or because he you know he's mated right and 
you know, he's passing down his genes to the next generation. Uh, the, the risk, of course, is that in some cases, the female might just eat the male before mating, right? And so the, the, for the, the risk for the male is to kind of uh, avoid that and figure out what the male, female's intention is, if you will, right? So there's actually a lot of mutual signaling going on as potentially, right? And if the, uh, so in that case, the female might get the benefit from, you know, eating a, a prey item essentially, uh, but the male is not gonna get any benefit. So that can happen as well uh, in specific circumstances, but on average, you know, the males should still uh, be uh, benefiting from sending these signals, okay? <clears throat> and by the way, uh, information here is defined actually in a very specific way. Um, this is actually the same information uh, definition that you use in, you know, communication theory. Um, um, in you know in engineering or, and uh, in you know in the physics, so it's basically a reduction in uncertainty uh, in an observed variable in an unobserved variable. Sorry, by observing another variable. Okay, uh, so this is sometimes defined as the mutual information, and this is basically uh, the the you can actually put a number to that by uh, assessing the uncertainty before uh, the signal is given, and then uh, uncertainty after the signal is given. And then uh, subtracting the entropy from the from the um, uncertainty before, and uh, from the, the subtracting from the entropy that uh, about uh, before the signal is giving uh, the entropy after the signal is giving. And if there's a reduction in entropy, then you, you what you have you, there has been information transfer. Okay, um, and that's sometimes called mutual in information. Okay. So this is uh, really about pro probabilities, and um, this is also, of course, affected by you know you know the animal's prior probability of you know about the interaction or about the uh, habitat, about the environment, etc. Uh, so what the prob probabilities uh, mean are are can be changed, but you can put a number to it. Okay, uh, that's the, the this isn't this isn't necessarily a kind of a. Uh, the, the term information is not necessarily you know a vacuous thing uh, or um, so it's a, it's actually a very quantitative variable here okay and that is actually the only equation that I have so uh, unlike the other guy I'm not going to show you any equation I'm pretty sure this is right by the way <laughs> all right <clears throat> so here uh, what do I have a fiddler crab so fiddler crab for instance uh, these the species of fiddler crab uh, and defend their um, their burrow uh, with, by waving this claw, this enlarged claw, which is both a kind of a uh, fighting tool, but also it also the, uh, is a, used as a signal, right? This waving indicates and how much they wave indicates uh, their motivation to fight, okay? And but if they fight, uh, you, you can kind of see the size of that uh, uh, claw. And if they fight, you know, the bigger claw males will actually, you know, win the fight, right? So uh, if you're another crab, um, you know, of looking to find a burrow, and you you know you have to decide whether you you have you want you're willing to fight over this burrow with this particular one, you know, uh, before he, he starts signaling, you have a certain probability of you know going into a fight versus you know not going into a fight or you know um, and winning the burrow, right? And after that, you know, there's a certain uncertainty about those probabilities, right? And then after uh, each of the, each signals, then those probabilities will be updated, and then those probabilities should change in a way that the that makes the outcome more certain, okay, or less uncertain. And it, it's not perfect. Oftentimes, this is not perfect, but uh, at least if for signals to be reliable, for signals to be defined as reliable, there should be some reduction in the uncertainty. Okay. <clears throat> Does that kind of make sense? Okay. Hopefully. All right. And by the way, there's um, the part of the definition of communication is that information transfer should be happening via signal. Okay, and you have to now decide the do you have to define the signals here? Okay, and distinguish them from other things that are uh, also informative to the animals, but uh, they're not signals. Okay, so animals, of course, are taking in information about their you know environment all the time, right? And a lot of this information is not signal, right? But they still reduce the uncertainties about their kind of you know surroundings or about the interaction in some way, right? So uh, those those inform those kind of uh, traits or uh, information you know transfer units that are uh, kind of out there uh, without being a signal, without being elaborated for specifically for the information transfer is called cues, okay? 
So queues are essentially out there, they're leaked, they're automatically pre available to the you know, animals and they're re relatively easily assessed. And you know, oftentimes animals do not really have control over whether to kind of uh, release them or not, right? So for instance, if you're a male spider uh, that's looking to mate with a female and you found a female's nest net and you're trying to get to her and you know, to mate, uh, the fact that you step on the net, uh, if you will, uh, that's gonna vibrate the net, right? And that's a cue uh, for you know for your for your presence there, right? For the male's presence uh, to the female, right? Uh, that's kind of cannot be helped. You have to be physically, you know, getting to the net uh, to uh, approach the female, right? But of course, once you're on the net, then you can, as as a male, you can actually start signaling by vibrating the net deliberately, right? Uh, without necessarily you know kind of stepping by. But you know, just vibrating it, and that's the that's the uh, signal, uh, and that those are behaviors or traits that are elaborated um, for that for the information they transfer, right? Um, and that oftentimes these are uh, kind of uh, either th these are these these traits or behaviors are have evolved because the animal it the sender uh, benefits from. Um, you know, displaying be those behaviors or traits, okay? And the benefit is always measured to relative to not, no, not signal, okay? So in the case of spider, they may benefit because the female will not take it, mistake that male as a, as a prey, uh, but as a, you know, they're gonna actually figure out that this is a male, okay? And, you know, they, they might also figure out something about the, you know, about the traits of the male um, and so on, okay? Should I be getting, uh, Admitting people from the waiting room, or, or there's a couple of people in the waiting room. Yeah, go ahead and admit them. All right. <clears throat> so that, that so the distinction between cues and signals are key. Signals are specifically evolved uh, structures or behaviors that are uh, that carry information to the receivers, and they do that because it benefits them. They if, they, if it doesn't benefit them, then obviously you know they they probably wouldn't have evolved. Okay. All right, so the major questions in animal communication is, uh, what does, uh, why does the animals uh, need to signal? Uh, what are the benefits of signaling, right? Um, is, there, is the behavior an action as, or an action, uh, a signal or merely a cue, right? Uh, is that, does the animal actually have any control over displaying this trait or displaying this uh, behavior or not? And if it's a signal, what's the evidence of it uh, for having elaborated for signal function? And finally, uh, does the signal really carry uh, reliable information or true information to the receivers? Okay, and that's the la the last question is what we're gonna kind of focus on this in this lecture. Okay. So uh, the honesty, uh, and by the way, honesty is the on the signaling. I don't know if Errol talked about on the signaling uh, theory at all in his lecture, but uh, I hope that. So uh, the evolution puzzle of honesty is kind of uh, an interesting one because uh, for a long time, actually, people assumed that the signals were, you know, uh, kind of us. And, you know, lay people usually tend to assume that the when animals signal to each other, they kind of do that for transferring information, right? Uh, if the, otherwise, why would they signal, right? So uh, when you have, you have a signaler and you have a signal and there's a receiver and the, the, the problem of honesty is not so much a problem of honesty when the uh, interest of animals align, right? And this is something that, you know, the lay people you often assume, right? When, uh, uh, you know, uh, two animals are, you know, kind of uh, singing to each other, they just say, oh, what, what, what a lovely kind of song, you know, and you know, they're kind of serenading each other, right? Uh, of course, of, oftentimes that's not the case, but sometimes it is the case, right? Uh, and in fact, there's a lot of times, uh, a lot of contexts where the interest of the signal and receiver does align. Uh, so a classic example of this is the honeybee dance, right? Uh, the honeybees, uh, which are, you know, the female workers of the honeybee colonies, they go out and find food sources, right? And they come, they come back and then they signal to the nest mates where the food sources are, right? And, and the, the nest mates and the, and the signaler in this case, um, uh, the, the worker bee that actually knows where the food source is, have this common interest because they, they're both working for producing honey for the, for the colony, right? So they actually have uh, kind of a common interest in figuring out where the food source is. So the signal should be reliably signaling 
the, uh, the, the direction and the distance of the food source. And the receiver should look at that signal and uh, you know, take, you know, take that into account and go away and find the food source, right? But of course, in many cases in the animal kingdom, the um, social interactions ha happen because there is a conflict or conflict of interest, right? Such as, for instance, territorial interactions or mating interactions or competing for mates or for competing for uh, kind of a resource like a you know perch or a, you know um, food resource, whatever, right? In that cases, uh, there's actually an incentive uh, for the signaler to uh, exaggerate uh, or kind of um, you know this otherwise dishonestly signal their intentions or their uh, state. And if the receivers actually believe this dishonest signal, then they presumably pay a cost uh, relative to not kind of believing that, right? So that's that's where the puzzle comes comes along, right? So how do you ensure honesty in these situations where uh, the interests are conflict, the, when the interests are conflicting between two individuals, between the signaler and the receiver? And that's a um, and there's a lot of theory behind that, but um, there's actually uh, this, you know. Uh, for a long time in animal behavior and in biology, people kind of assume that, well, this is a puzzle. Yeah, sure, we understand why the puzzle might be, but you know that's kind of beside the point because uh, if the signals weren't honest, then we wouldn't see them, right? If you think about it, that's a kind of a powerful argument. Argument: um, if the signals were dishonest as and they don't actually carry any information to the receivers, then the receivers should just stop, you know, responding to them. They should ignore that, right? And if the receivers are ignoring them, why would any animal display any signal that is that has any kind of cost, right? Uh, if it's costly, if it's not costly, then they could, you know, they might be still kind of displaying that uh, behavior or you know signal. Uh, but receivers should still be ignoring that, right? And if there's a, a even a minuscule cost uh, of this, you know, displaying the signal, then you know they shouldn't ex exist, right? Uh, so this was kind of the you know, so the classical theory, the classical ethology uh, didn't really focus on the question of honesty uh, for a long period of time, right? And then came along in the 70s, the sociobiology. Uh, here we have Dawkins because the Dawkins actually wrote a kind of influential paper in 1979 with, uh, uh, with, the, with John Krebs. And they make the argument that uh, you shouldn't expect signals to be honest when interests are conflicting, right? And in fact, what they actually went to the other extreme and they said all communication when interests are uh, misaligned is actually an attempt to manipulate, manipulate the other individual. And so there's an, so Dawkins and Krebs to say that there's, a, there's always an attempt to manipulate the other, uh, the, the receiver by your signals, right? And uh, the receiver in turn is trying to resist those attempts at manipulation. So they're trying to actually do kind of mind, re mind reading. Uh, and trying to figure out whether your deception, decept, you know, there's there's actually deception or something, right? And uh, you know, as you might expect, the the truth turns out to be kind of somewhere in the middle, and uh, where signals are signals tend to be on average reliable, um, and uh, when they're not reliable, then there's actually a reason behind it. Okay. But this is kind of a Google. This is a Google engram graph, uh, which kind of shows that the the term honest signaling hasn't been in use until you know the 80s too much and uh, but more recently it says it is actually a very kind of a hot topic um, or very kind of prominent topic here. <clears throat> okay. So you might have a, um, so when you have a behavior, so that just to summarize the kind of things, it's just introduction and you have a behavior, uh, the first thing you should ask yourself in, you know, whether it's a, is whether that behavior is a cue or a signal, whether it has been elaborated for the signal function. And then if it is in fact adapted for the signal function, then you can ask yourself whether there's actually, whether that information uh, carries true information, in which case both the signaler and the receiver is supposed to supposedly benefiting. Uh, so there's some mutual benefit or there might be some information or propaganda, in which case only the sender benefits. Okay, and then a third possibility is that uh, there might be a signal that actually is uh, carries some mutual information or true information to uh, the sender to the receiver, so that they mutually benefit from it. But then those that signals might be actually be that signals might be being eavesdropped upon by others, and. In that case, uh, the, only the receiver benefits from that act. Okay, um, so that cue uh, or that signal that you know is given 
for uh, for another purpose might actually uh, serve as a kind of a uh, almost a queue by an eavesdropper, and as a result, they might benefit from that. Okay, so you have all these three possibilities. Um, with the when the sender benefits uh, and the receiver benefits, you have true communication. When only the receiver benefits, uh, or sorry, when only the sender benefits from the signal and or the receiver does not benefit, then you have deceit or manipulation. And this is oftentimes uh, seen in you know kind of this uh, interspecies mimicry, for instance, this um, femme fatale flies, uh, the fireflies that uh, uh, mimic uh, another species of fireflies uh, signals, mating signals, or you know, this species recognition signals to lure the males. And then when the males come, they eat them, right? Uh, in that case, the sender truly benefits from this, right? Uh, by making the male think, uh, but that there's a female, the fertile female of, of your own species there. And the female uh, that gives a signal uh, actually benefits because you know they, they get food, food delivery essentially, right? So in that case, that there's that's the seed of manipulation. And again, this is this system only works because uh, the signal, the species recognition signal uh, of the of the the fireflies, on average, is still beneficial for the males and the females of that species, right? Uh, if it isn't, then they should evolve, uh, not giving the signal, right? If if every time, every instance that you see the signal, uh, it's actually the spam petal of the other species. Right, then you shouldn't, as a male, you should stop responding to that signal uh, because that's a, that is a reliable signal that of uh, you know your uh, that of, of be, you you being eaten or in the near future, right? Um, but on average, of course, the, the 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 fireflies of the smaller species still use these signals and um, you know to find their mates, and therefore the signals still persist. And the, in this case, the fan fatale, the, the, the deceptive signals are kind of piggybacking on this reliable signal, signaling system. Okay? And this is something that you see uh, uh, in a lot of kind of cases of mimicry where there's a kind of a, um, <clears throat> the, the system, the signal uh, is um, um, on average reliable, but um, there is kind of these uh, you know, deceptive signalers uh, that are kind of piggybacking on this reliable signal. That's gonna on average lower the fitness effects, but it's still the net benefit is uh, positive. Okay, and in other cases, uh, in the eavesdropping cases, you might have uh, you know senders not benefiting from the signal, uh, where and the receiver actually benefits the signal. And this, a good example of this is you know east, bats eavesdropping on frog calls, for instance, in this uh, very creative the name frog eating bat, uh, which you know when the bat hears the frog calls. Um, you know the frogs of course the male frogs are calling to you know attract mates and uh the bats are you know listening to those calls and saying oh this is lunch or you know rather kind of midnight snack or, or i guess this is lunch for them midnight snacks are lunch for them so yeah so in that case you have receivers benefiting from the signal and senders obviously not benefiting from signals because they become they get eaten okay uh presumably uh this doesn't exist the cases where this both the sender and the receiver Better, uh, kind of do worse than not signaling it doesn't exist. Uh, in some cases, I, I think in humans, there's you know there might be some spiteful signaling, right? Um, and in that, in those cases, you know that you might have to think about kind of what, what's happening in the larger communication network, whether that's you know that that signal that immediately has a cost to the sender and the receiver actually has some delayed benefits to you know maybe their kin or their reputation or whatever, right? Uh, but presumably in animals, this doesn't exist much, right? Because that will be kind of nonsensical. If sender and the receiver do not benefit from each other, then, you know, this, those signals should kind of get selected out relative to, you know, and the benefit again is relative to non signal okay? Any, any comments, questions so far? All clear? All right, so now um, coming back to the question of honesty, we can then ask whether how honesty is maintained, right? So, and the, the answer uh, is to, to make the signals either uh, constrained, costly, or police uh, the signals, uh, police instance of deceptive signal, okay? And they all come down to kind of the same idea of uh, making uh, uh, cheating uh, or deceptive uh, either impossible by use, by you know tying it by tying the signal to a physical constraint, or 
at least very costly to the uh, signaler so that this, the, 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 the deception isn't really worth it, okay? So the first, the, the first part is, uh, and the easy part, the easiest way of understanding this is the uh, making the signal uh, constraint in a physical manner, uh, such that the, the, it cannot be cheated, okay? Uh, because they are tied to a physical constraint, okay? And this is actually the case in, uh, in many animals where the pitch size is actually correlated with the body size, okay? And the, the lower the pitch of, an, uh, of, an, of a vocalization, uh, the larger the animal, okay? And oftentimes larger animals indicate, you know, um, you know, the size of the large size indicates, you know, a better ability to compete or, you know, higher survival abilities or, you know, the fact that you have survived for longer, which might indicate that you had, kind of, you know, you're, you're better, smarter, whatever, right? So, uh, <clears throat> so that, that's kind of the easiest way to kind of uh, ensure honesty, right? And this is termed the, in the index signal because in that case, the vocalization or the sound, the pitch of the sound is, Serving as an index that is directly tied to the uh, to the size, okay, and the size, you know, and it, but it also evolves, uh, but it also kind of allows the size to be evaluated from a distance, right? So uh, the, in this case, again, the receiver and the sender benefits because sender actually the senders actually get to you know uh, advertise their you know large size if they have a lower pitch, and the receivers get benefit from that because uh, they get to evaluate the other guy's size. Uh, without getting too close to it uh, and potentially getting into kind of an altercation or maybe potentially getting into a mating situation that they didn't necessarily want, right? So both the singular and the receiver, in this case, benefit from this kind of remote uh, assessment, if you will, okay? So a good, exa good example of this is actually the roaring contest of uh, the red, red deer stacks. Um, in this case, it's not so much the pitch uh, because the pitch turns out to be uh, a relatively unreliable uh, case, unreliable signal of the um, of the size of the red deer sag, the male red deers, uh, because the pitch can actually be manipulated. Uh, they actually can lower their pitch because of their descent larynx, and uh, so they can actually talk deeper or you know, roar rather deeper uh, than you know than they would have. Uh, given their size, okay? And this is actually something that we humans do as well. I can speak in a lower voice, or I can speak in a higher voice, right? So we can actually manipulate the pitch of our sound and Red Deer can do that. And, you know, in this contest, uh, they do try to do as roar as deep as possible, but the constraint here is as, how long and how loud you can actually roar, okay? So the intensity of the signal, the, the, the duration and the kind of amplitude of that uh, roar is an index of your physical health, uh, both your size and your, you know, the, the capacity of your lungs and uh, your fighting ability. How, 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 you know, how much you can, you know, expand your breadth on that, right? Um, it's not a perfect uh, correlation, however, because you know there is some sort of uh, mot some motivational factors here as well, right? Uh, because, you know, if you're really motivated to uh, mate, if that's, for instance, your last year uh, or you, you're old and getting, you're not sure that you're going to survive, um, then you might actually be more motivated to uh, roar, right, uh, and expend more energy into, the, into roaring and mating um, as opposed to, uh, you know, self-maintenance because, you, you know, your self-maintenance is not going to pay off for in the long run, right? So, in, so there's, there's potentially uh, less of a kind of a, it's not a perfect correlation, right? And sometimes, um, and there's actually also, you know, some transmission issues, right? So um, the amplitude, for instance, depends on the distance from the other, other males. And these, these, these males roar to each other uh, to get access to female parents, right? So, um, so, you know, they go onto a hillside and the other guys on a hillside, you know, 100 meters away, maybe. Uh, or more, and then they roar to each other, and then um, you know there's you know this the, the how much the sound transmits uh, depends on the wind, depends on the kind of a, uh, temperature, humidity, etc. Things like that, right? So it's the at the receiver end, it's not going to be a perfect correlation, right? Even there's a, even if there's a perfect correlation at the uh, singular end, right? So what they do is when they when they can't actually re resolve these issues, and sometimes, by the way, uh, you know, uh, roaring will be you know the two males that roar to each other will roar uh, pretty close to each other. Uh, so the contest will not will not be resolved with that. So what they do is they come together at, at that point and do this parallel walk, right? And the parallel walk is another case of kind of an index signal where uh, it allows the males uh, to basically size each other up, okay? 
And so you're basically walking parallel with this guy in you know a, a few meters behind be, between you, yourself and the other guy, and you literally see what how big the other guy is, okay, um, from the side, and that's gonna kind of give you how much how much muscles there there is, right? So presumably they're evaluating the the their opponent's uh, you know uh, size and strength, uh, and presumably they do it relative to their own size and strength, right? And if it's still too close. Um, there's still some error involved in this assessment, but you know more reliable than the Roran contest. If it's still too close at that stage, then they what they do is they start getting into this kind of contest, actual contest where they push each other with the rams. And sometimes they, you know you've seen cases probably where you know uh, these males uh, male stags will kind of get locked into each other and they will actually keep pushing each other until they can't you know disengage because they got kind of locked and then they eventually end up dying and uh, you, you find a skull of two males kind of interlocked uh, with the interlocked antlers and so on, right? But this, the, this last stage uh, in this hierarchical signaling system, which gives successively more reliable information about the fighting ability of the, of your opponent is, uh, it, it, that gives you the, the, basically the most direct assessment of the size because now you're actually kind of engaged in this contest, right? Uh, of pushing, right? So if the if 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 the 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 signaling system gets uh, successfully more reliable in this kind of classic hierarchical system, okay. <clears throat> now, so this is kind of uh, index signal. The other uh, way of making signals honest is uh, to uh, make them costly, okay. And here's a kind of a graphical example of this uh, gra graphical explanation of this. There's actually a you know kind of a quantitative theory behind this as well. But uh, I think the best way to explain this is through this graphical example that was created by Johnstone, Rufus Johnstone. Uh, so here we have on, oops, sorry, here we have on the y-axis the fitness cost of benefit, okay, and on the x-axis we have the signal intensity, okay, and the signal intensity varies continuously. Let's assume, and uh, for any given individual, uh, producing a signal in, signal at a given intensity will have a fitness cost, all right. And uh, from it, it's also going to have a fitness benefit, right? The benefit might be due to you know uh, mating opportunities or due to access to a resource, right? And the cost is potentially due to you know energetic costs uh, or you know cost of getting you know that you incur because you're you know by producing the signal you're getting you're putting yourself in a risky place, etc. Right? Uh, so for instance, you know you might be if you're if you're bird singing. You know, uh, a predator might hear you, and then you know you might get you might get you might increase your risk of predation uh, when you sing, right? So whatever the whatever the mechanism, there's a cost, there's a fitness cost, right? And if that cost is different from for one individual than for another individual, then you actually can get honest signaling where the the individuals that pay a lower cost per signal intensity actually signal at a higher level, and you can kind of see that by plotting two different cost curves or cost lines, where the, if this is the cost for, let's say, low quality individual, and it has a steeper slope, and that which means that the in, as the intensity gets higher, they actually start paying more and more at a high cost at the higher rate, right? Then compared to a high quality individual, then their optimal level of signaling will actually be different from each other, right? So in this case, uh, the optimal level for the uh, low quality individual is going to be here uh, and the optimum is just simply uh, sub, you know, subtract the benefit from the cost, right? And the optimum for the co high quality individual will be, uh, you know, both, you know, uh, as a magnitude, it's going to be, you know, higher, right? Uh, but as at the signal intensity, it's actually going to be at a higher signal intensity, okay? And this is called the differential cost model. Um, and this is you know, kind of a, a case where you can apply to a situation where uh, there's potential conflict of interest, like for instance, or, you know, uh, territorial contests or maybe potentially mating contests. Okay. Uh, here we assume the benefit is the benefit curve is kind of the same, but you can kind of assume the benefit is varying uh, also depending on the individuals. Um, and in fact, you know, there's actually another model where the fresh, you know, the benefit actually varies. Uh, the cost doesn't vary, but the benefit varies uh, depending on the individual. And it, that that model can be applied to parent offspring communication, and you know, where the neatest offspring will signal more, and the parents will actually, you know, pay attention to the signal because that's where they can allocate the resource, uh, you know, and get the most payoff from the from that. 
Okay. Uh, so then that's a differential need model. Okay. Um, one other thing about this model is uh, here we have a kind of linearly increasing cost uh, for the uh, low and high quality individuals, but you can actually extend this model by actually uh, making the cost uh, basically zero up to until a certain intensity level and then start going up afterwards. Uh, and then the, the point where it, at which uh, the cost curve starts to go up uh, might be different between low and high quality. And in those cases, you might actually have signals that are basically not costly to produce per se, but they're still costly to cheat, right? If you were kind of uh, uh, de deviating from that signal intensity from your optimal signal intensity, you will still do let do be worse off uh, compared to your optimal level of intensity, right? Uh, and and the, the intuition is that uh, for the low quality individual, they can signal at a higher level, they're gonna pay a high, higher cost and they're gonna have a higher benefit, but the difference in benefit and the cost is gonna be lower than their optimal level of uh, signal intensity. So it doesn't really pay off for the low quality individual to cheat, if you will. Right? <clears throat> okay, does this kind of make sense, the handicap model? So, uh, uh, and this is called a handicap model for reasons that I, you know, uh, are kind of historical, um, but the it's called handicap model because Zahavi called it, right? A guy named Amos Zahavi uh, termed it a handicap. And he was actually literally uh, thinking about animals handicapping each other. And he was thinking about cases like this uh, long-tailed widow bird here, which is a, you know, bird uh, in which the males uh, display flying around in their territory in, this, in the savanna habitat. And unlike a normal, you know, reasonable bird, uh, they actually have this ridiculous long tail, right? And it looks like this widow's veil, right? And that's why they're called widow tail bird uh, or widow birds. And as the name implies, the long tail widow bird has a long, you know, tail. And uh, it really is kind of a drag, <laughs> literally, uh, for the male to fly around with this uh, uh, with this tail. It really literally drags them down, right? Or, and it's hard to fly around uh, with this bird. It's energetically hard, right? So the bird seems to be uh, evolutionist, you know, over evolutionary time, this bird has, seems to have evolved this handicap that impedes his ability to fly and display to females, right? So that's like a super weird thing. And this is what the Zahavi was, why Zahavi kind of was uh, using the term handicap, right? Um, and only the good males or the high quality males, so males with, you know, strong you know, flight muscles and, you know, uh, ability to defend the territory or, you know, fly away from potential predators uh, when the predator actually shows up, are going to be able to do display the signal, right? They display this long tail, right? Uh, otherwise, they're not going to be able to display, it, right? Uh, so, for weaker males, the cost of having the same month, same length of tail is going to be much higher than uh, for the strong males, right? And that might ensure uh, the uh, reliability of the signal uh, to uh, or the, the information uh, that is transferred to the uh, to the females in this case. Okay. Another case of this, of course, is the the peacock's tail potentially, right? And that's kind of still in the air, but the, the idea is that the, the peacock's tail, the, the long train of the peacock uh, is actually a very hard thing to grow and maintain, right? These guys, you know, peacocks generally stay on the ground uh, and then they're, you know, you know, the males are displaying to the females uh, this ridiculously long uh, kind of uh, tails uh, or the train as it's called. And then they're kind of easy prey to potential predators, right? And you know this this might actually impede their ability to uh, escape from a ground predator if uh, if one shows up, and only the you know the highest quality males could maybe escape. Right, that's the idea. Right, and um, now the evidence for that is kind of uh, not it's a little sketchy. Uh, that's kind of the main assumption, but the evidence is a little sketchy. There's one experiment that I know of that actually explicitly tested the escape velocity thing and didn't find any effect. Uh, so there might be other things going on with the, for instance, with the eye spots and so on. Uh, but yeah, so that's that, that's kind of like the idea of handicapping. Okay, and this is kind of a really nice far side cartoon about the interaction here. <laughs> and, and by the way, so Zahavi came up with this handicap hypothesis in 1975, I believe, and nobody believed him. Uh, well, very few people believed him at least. Okay, um, and so, so this is. I'm sorry. I, don't know why that is actually copied there. But yeah, so um, at, the, at around the same time, um, this guy, Michael Spence, who was an economist,
came up with the same idea, essentially. Mathematically speaking, it's the same idea. Uh, Zahavi didn't actually have a mathematical model, by the way. Um, so he, he just made this kind of verbal argument that I just made, right? Um, uh, but Michael Spence, uh, being an economist, uh, used game theory, and uh, he was interested in, uh, in why people go to college, even though uh, they don't really learn anything you know, that's useful that in their jobs afterwards, after the college, right? And that's generally kind of true where you, you know, uh, anything you learn in college, uh, they tend to, you know, if you actually go to a real job, you don't necessarily tend to work, you use all that information, right? Uh, you might use some of it if you're lucky, but oftentimes they, you kind of don't end up not using any, right? Unless you're in a kind of applied field, like, uh, well, I mean, if you're in, a, in, you know, medical school or something, right? So he was interested in why, you know, people were kind of interested in uh, why people actually bothered to go to college and why employers actually cared if people go to college, right? And he basically came up with the same uh, kind of same graph that I showed you earlier, uh, uh, the Johnston model, where he, uh, this is actually the, uh, the, the amount of education, right? That uh, one person gets, and this is the cost of education for him. And this, the cost is basically, you know, how, um, uh, you know, your grade, it could be, you know, how much you, studying you have to do, how much resources that you have to spend uh, in terms of, you know, for individual uh, resources, whatever that resources might be, uh, to get a college degree, right? And let's say this is a, this is a guy who, uh, this is a person who is going to pay a very high cost to go to college and get a degree, right? Uh, because he's, you know, he's not necessarily very smart or whatever, right? Or very conscientious, so it's going to be hard to, for him to get to college go through college. And this says this guy has a lower cost, uh, okay, because he's, you know, maybe he's more, uh, he's more intelligent or he's more conscientious, et cetera, right? Uh, and this is the benefit from where, from the college degree that they would get. And at some point uh, with a college degree, let's say with a four year degree, you're gonna get a better job and that's gonna get better, you know, salary, right? And for this guy who's gonna pay a very steep cost for going to the college and getting a bachelor's degree, it doesn't really make sense to, get that job, right? Because even if he gets that job, his payoff is gonna be this, but he actually would get a better job or better payoff uh, on average uh, if he actually did just not no education, no college, right? For this guy, however, uh, the benefit of getting a college degree is gonna be higher because he, if he gets a college degree, he's gonna get the better job. And this, the difference between the benefit and the cost that he pays at the optimal level is gonna be, this right, so it makes sense for him for the for the lower cost uh, for the guy who uh, end up you know paying a lower cost uh, will actually to get a you know kind of a college education or a single is uh, college uh, degree right, and that in, and the employer should be should hire that because that cost potentially presumably depends on you know things that are actually functional in the workplace like intelligence or conscientiousness etc right, so this is conceptually the same model. Um, Michael Spence ended up getting the Nobel Prize for, in part for this model, and Zahavi kind of got ridiculed for about you know ten years uh, before people, before biologists really figured out how to make his model work. Okay, and very smart people in, bi in biology actually tried to make his model work and initially couldn't, uh, and you know eventually they they managed to do that. Yeah. Okay. All right. Um, now, actually, you guys want to take a break? And we come back. This might be a good time to break. Take a break, if you want, because we've been talking for 50 minutes. Uh, okay, John. Should we take a 10 or 15 minutes break? Sure. Yeah. That uh, sounds good.